ever. The fire from heaven that kindled the wood in the new altar and that consumed the sacrifices on it showed that Jehovah had accepted the temple and its altar. It showed he approved of the transfer of his worship from the old tabernacle to this sacred place on Mount Moriah. He was now present in his temple as he had been in the tabernacle. Now that Jehovah, not that Jehovah was literally present in that uh, material temple, any more than he was bodily present in the less pretentious tabernacle built by Moses. Neither that temple nor that tabernacle could contain the great God of the universe. Solomon himself confessed that fact at the temple's inauguration, saying in his prayer, But will God truly dwell with mankind upon the earth? Look, heaven, yes, the heavens of the heavens themselves cannot contain you, how much less than this house that I have built. Jehovah was present in that holy temple on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, only by sending forth his power from his heavenly throne and making its operation visible at the temple by the glory cloud and by the fire from the sky. He was also present in that temple by keeping his attention fixed upon it and by answering prayers that were offered there or that were directed there by believers who prayed with their faces toward it. As Solomon himself said, in his inauguration prayer. You must turn toward the prayer of your servant and to his request for favor, O Jehovah my God, by listening to the cry of joy and to the prayer with which your servant is praying before you, that your eyes may prove to be open toward this house day and night, toward the place where you said you would put your name by listening to the prayer with which your servant prays toward this place. And as Jehovah himself said to Solomon later at Gibeon, I have sanctified this house that you have built by putting my name there to time indefinite, and my eyes and my heart will certainly prove to be there always. The time came when Jehovah withdrew his presence from that temple of Solomon because the priests and Levites willfully kept on polluting the covenant of Levi and the nation of Israel broke, uh, broke all the laws of Jehovah's covenant with them. With his presence gone, that temple became subject to destruction by the Babylonian armies in 607 before Christ. And some survivors of the temple polluting nation were carried off captive to Babylon. Seventy years later, because a faithful remnant prayed toward the location of the former temple at Jerusalem and showed a heartfelt desire to renew the pure worship there, Jehovah delivered them from captivity to Babylon. He brought them back to Judah and Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and restore divine worship there in its purity. Under Governor Zerubbabel, and high priest Jeshua. The temple and its altar were rebuilt and Jehovah's worship was renewed on its own old site. That temple built by the repentant and restored remnant proved to be not nearly as glorious outwardly as Solomon's temple. Nevertheless, it was in connection with this rebuilt temple of the restored remnant that Jehovah God caused the last prophecy before the Christian era to be uttered by Malachi, including this remarkable statement, Malachi 3.1. Behold, I send my messenger or angel, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the angel of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he cometh, saith Jehovah of hosts. That temple rebuilt by the remnant under Governor Zerubbabel did not have in its innermost room or most holy the Ark of Jehovah's Covenant. 
At its inauguration in 516 before Christ, no glory cloud had filled it. No fire came down from heaven and devoured the sacrifices on the altar. Yet God's presence had been resumed at that temple and his pure worship had been restored as in Moses' days. Why then did Malachi, about 70 years later, say that the Lord, and the Hebrew on that is Ha Adon, why did he say that the Lord whom ye seek will suddenly come to his temple and the angel of the covenant whom ye delight in? It was because in the meantime the temple priesthood had become disrespectful of Jehovah's altar and service and had polluted his covenant with Levi. Moreover, because the priests failed in their God-given duties, the people had grown materialistic. They questioned whether it was worthwhile to worship and serve Jehovah and whether he was really present at his temple, paying attention to what was going on under the cloak of religious hypocrisy. They were making God feel tired at their saying over and over again, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of God or Jehovah, and he delighteth in them. Or, where is the God of judgment? If he got tired of hearing such disrespectful, defiant talk, ought he not at last to do something about it, acting with suddenness? Yes. Were they asking, where is the God of judgment? Well then, let them know where he is when he suddenly comes to his temple for judgment work. The Lord whom they pretended to seek and who suddenly comes to his temple is Jehovah God himself. He is the Adon or the master to whom the temple belongs and whose name is on it and who comes to the place where he is supposed to be worshipped. But when he comes this time, he comes not alone, but accompanied by the angel of the covenant. Because of the severity of the judgment that would take place after he came with the angel of the covenant, Jehovah promised that he would mercifully send his messenger and this one would prepare the way before him. If conditions were not prepared among his temple worshipers before his arrival at the temple, then the entire nation would be in danger of being wiped out like Sodom and Gomorrah, baptized by fire from heaven. This prophecy of the Lord Jehovah's coming to his temple with his angel of the covenant was not fulfilled upon Zerubbabel's temple. However, Zerubbabel's temple was replaced by a grander temple built by the Edomite Herod the Great when he became king over Judah and Jerusalem by Rome's decree. Upon this temple, a fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy did come and that with a special foreshadowing of events of our own day in this 20th century. Jesus Christ himself pointed out whom the preparatory messenger was in his time, namely John the Baptist, who had finished his work and who was then in prison soon to be beheaded. Quoting from the scripture, this is he concerning whom it is written. Here I am sending forth my messenger before you to prepare your way ahead of you. John began his preaching and baptizing about six months in advance of Jesus and prepared a small remnant of Israelites to receive him. That fact did not mean that Jesus was the Lord who suddenly comes to his temple. Jesus is not Jehovah, the Lord of the temple. He is Jehovah's angel of the covenant who accompanies him to the temple. And that covenant is the covenant that Jehovah made with faithful Abraham saying, by means of your seed or offspring, all nations of the earth will certainly bless themselves. 
Since the preparatory messenger had come, it was therefore in Jesus' day that the Lord Jehovah was to come suddenly to the temple to show where the God of judgment is. Now that the Lord Jehovah, not that the Lord Jehovah had to come personally and visibly to the temple, any more so than he came visibly to the tabernacle in the wilderness at Mount Sinai or visibly to Solomon's temple at Jerusalem. But Jesus Christ, his angel of the covenant of blessing, did come visibly to Jehovah's temple back there. He came as a visible representative of the Lord Jehovah. And by putting his spirit on Jesus, Jehovah was with him in coming to that temple at Jerusalem in 33 AD. After his baptism by John in the Jordan River, Jesus received a spiritual begetting when Jehovah's voice came from heaven saying, this is my son, the beloved whom I have approved. And he was anointed to be king by the descending of Jehovah's spirit upon him as symbolized by a descending dove. Three and a half years afterward, Jesus rode like a king on coronation day into the royal city of Jerusalem. To the temple he, he came but he was not received by the high priest and anointed to be king of the Jews and then hailed by all the priests and the Levites. Oh no, they were polluters of the covenant of Levi. They did not accept Jehovah's great sacrificial lamb for the sins of mankind and the law of truth was not in their mouths. They objected indignantly to many boys in the temple hailing Jesus and crying out, Save, we pray, the son of David. Since they did not do so, it took Jesus, not those priests and Levites, to drive the money changers and the bird and animal sellers out of the temple and to say, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you, you have made it a cave of robbers. Those were Jehovah's words that Jesus there quoted, and Jehovah was thus his angel of the covenant in this expression of judgment at the temple, cleansing it at least of this religious commercialism. One day later, Jesus declared that Jehovah was abandoning or withdrawing his presence from the temple, saying to the scribes and Pharisees and people in Jerusalem, Look, your house is abandoned to you. Leaving no mistake about it, that this meant the destruction of Herod's uh, temple, like the destruction of Solomon's temple by the Babylonians in 607 before, before Christ. Jesus said to his disciples while sightseeing through the temple, do you not behold all these things? Truly I say to you, by no means will a stone be left here upon a stone and not be thrown down. Two days later, the priestly polluters of the covenant of Levi in effect said, where is the God of judgment? And they handed over God's angel of the covenant to the uncircumcised Romans to be executed in public disgrace on a tree like a criminal slave. The God of judgment saw that when these priests and Levites would go back to their duties at the temple, it would be with their hands reddened with the blood of his angel of the covenant. So when his dying angel of the covenant gasped out his last words, it has been accomplished. Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Then Jehovah himself came to the temple by his power aimed directly at the most holy. No, not with a glory cloud filling the house, not by fire from heaven miraculously consuming the animal sacrifices on the temple altar. No, but by causing the earth under the temple city to quake and the rock masses to be split, and by hiding the sun from shining on the temple, and by ripping the curtain of the sanctuary down the middle, 
rendering it like tissue paper from its 30-foot height down to its bottom, although it was a double curtain of inches. <laughs> there Jehovah God, coming to his temple, exposed the innermost room as being bare of the Ark of the Covenant. Thirty-seven years more, and not only the innermost room, but also the whole temple of Jerusalem was invaded by fire kindled by the conquering Romans. And the building was raised to the ground, not a stone being left upon a stone in fulfillment of Jesus' word. The 97,000 Jewish survivors of the four-month siege of Jerusalem were led captive into all the nations. The, the city was demolished. The family records of priests and Levites and royal families were destroyed and lost and the natural Jews throughout the earth were left without a temple and an acting, identifiable priesthood. In truth, their sacred house had been abandoned to them by Jehovah God. But was Jehovah left without a temple? Could he never more be present in his holy temple? No for he had replaced the perishable material temple on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem with an enduring spiritual temple. On the third day after he ripped the sanctuary curtain from top to bottom, Jehovah God raised up the foundation cornerstone of his spiritual temple. How? God Almighty did this by resurrecting his son, his angel of the covenant from the dead to life and in the heavens. In accord with his sworn oath, Jehovah raised him up as a royal priest like Melchizedek, but having the divine nature. Because of the human sacrifice that he had laid down as such a priest, Jesus Christ was now Jehovah's royal high priest, possessing the merit of a sacrifice by means of which he could make atonement for mankind's sins and act as a mediator between God and men. By means of Holy Spirit, Jehovah God dwelt in Jesus, the living foundation cornerstone of the spiritual temple of God. No longer needed the dead stone material temple at Jerusalem. He had his son as the foundation cornerstone. Forty days from then, Jesus Christ ascended to his Father's heavenly throne, taking along the life value of his human sacrifice. Jehovah God accepted it and also laid his high priest on the heavenly Mount Moriah on Mount Zion as the precious foundation cornerstone. Since the glorified Jesus was merely the foundation cornerstone, it is manifest that Jehovah God did not purpose to use Jesus alone as his living spiritual temple. So on the day of Pentecost, just ten days afterward, Jehovah began to rear his spiritual temple upon Jesus, the living foundation cornerstone. He used Jesus the high priest to do the building of his spiritual house as, the antityp as an antitypical Solomon. Hence the Pente at Pentecost, Jehovah God begot Jesus' faithful apostles and other disciples on earth with the Holy Spirit to make them his spiritual sons. Then through Jesus, he poured out his Holy Spirit upon them to anoint them as members of a royal priesthood under Jesus Christ, the high priest. He made them living stones to be laid upon Jesus, the foundation cornerstone. Hence the Apostle Peter says to all anointed Christians, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected, as it is true by men, but chosen, precious with God. You yourselves also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house for the purpose of a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it is contained in Scripture, Look, I am laying in Zion a stone chosen, 
a foundation cornerstone precious. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for a special purpose, that you should declare abroad the excellencies of the one that called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So from the day of Pentecost forward, Jehovah has been dwelling in his holy spiritual temple of living stones. Through the Apostle Paul, he says to those priestly Christians, Do you not know that you people are God's temple and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Christ Jesus himself is a foundation cornerstone. In union with him, the whole building being harmoniously joined together is growing into the holy temple of Jehovah. In union with him, you too are being built up together into a palace for God to inhabit and to dwell. By the end of the first century, Christ's twelve apostles had died. Soon the building and growth of that spiritual temple was lost to view because of falling away from the pure temple faith. It came to be as when the Jews were captive in Babylon, while Jerusalem was in ruin, and Jehovah had no temple on earth in which to dwell by his spirit. Of course, Jehovah has always dwelt in the temple's foundation cornerstone, Jesus Christ, in heaven by means of his spirit, but the living stones on earth were long lost to view and practically unidentifiable. But shortly after 1870, or about 80 years ago, they began to come to view again. For these truths of the spiritual temple began to be recovered and applied to, and God's spirit was seen in action for producing the final remnant of the 144,000 living stones of the spiritual house. The modern history of Jehovah's Witnesses published in the columns of the Watchtower since the beginning of 1955 gives us details on this. But alongside of this remnant of spiritual living stones, the worldly religious systems of Christendom have claimed to be the house of God, his true temple, although they have still continued, fallen away from the temple faith, and have no evidence of Jehovah's dwelling in them by his spirit. They were trying or wearing Jehovah God by their religious talk, saying that evildoers were good and delights him in God's sight. So the question was forced to the front, where is the God of judgment? More and more the circumstances were calling for an event of worldwide religious importance to take place in fulfillment of prophecy. What was it? This the sudden coming of the Lord Jehovah to his true spiritual temple, accompanied by his angel of the covenant in the final fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy, closing it. Has the Lord Jehovah now come to his spiritual temple with his angel of the covenant? Christendom says, no. But that is because he has come suddenly and has caught Christendom red-handed in her unchristian acts. She no more appreciates Jehovah's coming with his covenant angel than the temple-polluting priests and the Levites appreciated the coming of Jesus to the temple and cleansing it, those religious courts of the thieves that were exploiters of religion. Back there, Jesus came and did that three and a half years after his baptism. Spirit begetting an anointing at the Jordan. Down here, Jesus came and began the cleansing in the spring of 1918, three and one half years after the birth of God's kingdom in 1914 and the heavenly enthronement of Jesus Christ as reigning king then. Let Christendom deny that 1918 is the date of the Lord Jehovah's suddenly coming to his spiritual temple as the God of judgment accompanied by his angel of the covenant, Jesus Christ. Nonetheless, the time of judgment is here 
upon all who claim to be God's house, whether truthfully or falsely. And judgment has been in progress since the spring of 1918 and onward. So it is proper to ask the question. So it is proper to ask the questions of Malachi's prophecy. But who shall endure the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? Today, after these 37 years since 1918, Christendom shows that she will not endure and stand as the professed house of God, for Jehovah's angel of the covenant is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's lie. Christendom cannot accept the real Christ in his kingly, priestly role today since the kingdom's birth in 1914. He is too hot for her, too much of a cleanser for her. There is no precious metal in her. She is all burnable stuff. There is no good fabric in her. She is all dirt to be cleaned away without the light. At Armageddon, the execution of the Lord Jehovah's judgment from his true spiritual temple will bring all of that to light. But who is it that has been able to face this day of his coming to the temple with his covenant angel and to endure it? It is those who have sincerely been seeking Jehovah. It is those who truly delight in his angel of the covenant and love his appearing. It is those who have been the only ones to call attention to the fact of his coming and presence at the temple with his angel of the covenant. It is Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> These are the ones that have shown a willingness to subject themselves to Jehovah's judgment through Christ, no matter how fiery, no matter how bleaching, and to endure a cleansing and a cleaning up of their doctrine, their organization, and their activity. Says Jehovah through Malachi, and he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them as gold and silver, and they shall offer unto Jehovah offerings in righteousness. The ancient sons of Levi were temple servants and guardians and offerers of the sacrifices. So the antitypical sons of Levi of today are the remnant of the living stones of the spiritual temple. They are the remnant of the royal priesthood under the high priest Jesus Christ who must offer spiritual sacrifices of praise and good works toward God and who must notify others of Christ's sacrifice for sin until the Lord's coming with his covenant angel to the temple in 1918, there was considerable faultiness about their spiritual sacrifices, which was not worthy of God's altar, and their organization was not altogether clean. But after World War I closed in 1918, they underwent a fiery purification in order, in order to offer unto Jehovah offerings in righteousness. All the world has now become aware of their offering spiritual sacrifices in righteousness since 1918. From the greatest offering by this remnant and antitypical sons of Levi has been their preaching, their obedience to the prophet, to the prophetic command that Jesus set forth in Matthew 24, 14. They have been devoted to Jehovah God in the preaching of this good news of God's established kingdom since 1914. And this has pleased Jehovah. To all the inhabited earth, they have endeavored to extend this preaching for a witness to all the nations before Satan's kingdom ends completely at the Battle of Armageddon. Within 30 years' time since 1918, the angel refiner at the temple has fierily refined the preaching organization to make it theocratic in its structure and its way of operation. 
As a result, the remnant has returned to the apostolic wave, the days of old, as in ancient years, all of which is very pleasant unto Jehovah God. Sad to relate, during World War I, the priestly remnant, the antitypical sons of Levi, were guilty of corrupting the covenant of Levi. By a defiling compromise with this world, so that Jehovah was angry with them. But since 1919, the angel refiner of the temple has purified them to be like precious metals. He has delivered them from worldly Babylon and ordered them to be bearers of vessels of Jehovah. No more to touch the unclean things of Babylon. They have since realized that the covenant of Levi calls for them to be the messengers of Jehovah of hosts, to keep knowledge upon their lips, to hold the law of truth in their mouth, to walk with God in peace and uprightness, and to turn away from iniquity. To do this, they realize that they had to be witnesses of Jehovah and to proclaim the kingdom truths. In recognition of that fact, they courageously embraced in 1931 the name Jehovah's Witnesses. They know now that the covenant of Levi calls for a clean priesthood, one that approves of no fornication or adultery, either spiritual or physically, a priesthood rendering exclusive devotion to God and proving this by keeping his worship of the temple pure and clean and unhypocritical. Like the landless Levites of old, they know that Jehovah is their inheritance and that their hope is the heavenly kingdom, and so they must keep their minds fixed on the things above. Hence, with all conscientiousness, they now try to keep the covenant of Levi. They insist on maintaining right worship in the new world society. To purify his people, Jehovah God tells us the things that he will be against when he comes and is present in his holy temple for judgment and for a purge of religion. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against the false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and uh, the turn aside the sojourner, the resident alien from his right. And fear not me, saith Jehovah of hosts, for I, Jehovah, change not. Therefore ye, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. From his coming to his temple until Armageddon, only a short period of time is allowed, and hence to save his spiritual Israel or spiritual sons of Jacob from being consumed in that universal war, Jehovah has had to be a swift witness in exposing wrongdoing and in purifying the remnant, uh, the repentant wrongdoers. In being a swift witness against the sorcerers, he has in 1920, in 1934, and in 1955 given us three powerful booklets exposing spiritism. He has also unmasked the so-called wise men from the East who came to visit the babe Jesus as being mere astrologers, unwitting tools used by the ruler of the demons to incite King Herod to try to kill Jesus. He has also exposed the great pyramid of Giza as being not God's stone witness or the Bible in stone, but a monument of demonism to glorify belief in immortality of the soul or survival after death. With swiftness, Jehovah at his temple has also witnessed against those guilty of adultery or moral uncleanness, bodily or spiritually. And he has also revealed what unscriptural divorces are. He has taught his people to take an unadulterous position of neutrality towards all the political and military conflicts of this world. 
he has witnessed against the perjurers or those who have sworn falsely, especially the evil servant class, those who have sworn to God and have confirmed it, that I will observe thy righteous ordinances and yet have proved false by not carrying out their dedication to God and doing his will. Since false swearers are like hypocrites, Jehovah by his covenant angel has cast the evil slave class out of his organization and has withheld further spiritual light from them. Since Jehovah is now in his holy temple, in his holy spiritual temple for judgment work, Isaiah's prophecy has been undergoing fulfillment. And this is what Isaiah wrote. And it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of Jehovah's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up the mountain of Jehovah to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Jehovah from Jerusalem. And he will judge from his temple between the nations and will decide concerning many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. In ancient times, it was the custom to worship on high places. Jehovah was worshipped on a notably high place, on his holy mountain, Mount Moriah, over 2,400 feet above the Mediterranean Sea and 3,800 feet above the level of the Dead Sea. There his house, or temple, stood exalted. By putting his name upon his remnant of the spiritual temple and by sending them forth to be his witnesses, Jehovah has caused his name to be the most highly exalted in all the earth in these latter days because of keeping the covenant of Levi. Because of keeping the covenant of Levi and rendering exclusive devotion to Jehovah, the temple remnant have put his purified worship supreme over everything else specializing upon it as being of first importance according to their priestly obligations. No nation, no government has the right to interfere with it. And in a conflict between worshiping Jehovah and obeying human rulers who oppose him, the temple remnant put Jehovah's worship on top and firmly keep their service place in his temple, giving first to God what belongs to God. They have refused to quit offering their spiritual sacrifices of praising God and preaching the good news of his established triumphant kingdom, and they'll never stop. <laughs> this faithfulness to Jehovah's worship before all the world has exalted the house of Jehovah, the house of his worship, before all the nations. The patriotic worldings have resented this putting of Jehovah's worship, his house, up above all worldly governments and allegiances and all other religions. But the sheep-like people of all the nations appreciate this illustration of the supremacy of Jehovah's worship. From the temple remnant they learn to put his worship topmost in their lives and let it dominate even over all the mountain-like systems of the Satan's world. As Solomon's temple on Mount Moriah, more than 2,400 feet above the Mediterranean, was higher than the pagan temples of the capital cities of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, so Jehovah's worship is higher than all the devil's visible organization. 
That is the lofty elevation that the sheep-like ones of all nations assign to it in their lives. Therefore, they accept Jehovah's judgments and decisions from his supreme temple. They leave the devil's world and its religio-political mountains and their wars and their weapons of war and they ascend the mountain of the house of Jehovah to worship him there on this beautiful elevation above the debased world and its demon worship. They try to measure up to the high requirements of his worship. They dedicate themselves to him through his high priest, Jesus Christ. They recognize that their obligation to worship him at his house is higher than all allegiances to the mountain-like powers of this doomed old world. Are you a member of the remnant? Then do not think that since these other sheep are not spiritual Israelites with a heavenly inheritance, they have no right to enter the court of the spiritual temple to worship Jehovah through his high priest, Christ Jesus. Or, are you an antitypical foreigner from a distant country? Then do not think that because you are not of the remnant, you must be separated from Jehovah's Witnesses and cannot be given recognition among the New World Society, even if you join yourself to Jehovah in dedication. That is not Jehovah's line of thinking at all now that his salvation by his established kingdom is so very near. Says Jehovah concerning all the other sheep-like ones today who come from all the nations foreign to spiritual Israel. Neither let the foreigner that hath joined himself to Jehovah speak, saying, Jehovah will surely separate me from his people. Also the foreigners that join themselves to Jehovah to minister unto him and to love the name of Jehovah, to be his servants, every one that keepeth the Sabbath from profaning it, and holdeth fast my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain, on the top of which the temple is, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted upon mine altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The Lord Jehovah, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, said, Yet will I gather others to him besides his own that he has gathered. From 1919 on down to particularly 1931, Jehovah gathered the remnant, the spiritual Israelites, who were outcasts in bondage to the Babylonish world. Since then, he has been gathering others to himself at his temple besides his own Israelite remnant, which has been gathered. He has been doing the gathering of these others because he wants them there at the temple. Who has up till now been able to hinder Jehovah God from gathering them? The evil servant class? Christendom's clergy and their flock, political dictators, radical governments, totalitarian governments or other political powers of this world, Satan the devil and his demons? No, none of them. But today the active membership of the New World Society at Jehovah's Temple has swelled to 608,565 witnesses around the 16,691 of the temple remnant, making a grand total of 625,256 dedicated ministers preaching this good news of the kingdom in all the world for a witness. It is Jehovah's happy pleasure in this day to make these antitypical foreigners, these other sheep, joyful in my house of prayer. Has he made them happy in his worship? Ah, yes. The holy mountain of Jehovah's house rings with their outcries of happiness as they offer through his high priest 
their spiritual burnt offerings and sacrifices upon his altar. And as his evidence, acceptance of these, he is blessing them in their service and in his witness work. Nineteen centuries ago, the high priest Jesus Christ gave a vision to the apostle John in which John beheld that great crowd of foreigners from all nations in white robes with palm branches in their hands gathered at the temple. There hailing Jehovah and his self-sacrificing son and ascribing their own salvation to these and serving Jehovah day and night in his temple. What a wonderful experience for John to see that in vision. Yes, but what a soul-inspiring experience for us today to see it in its glorious actuality. <laughs> Still exercising divine patience for salvation of sheep-like people, Jehovah is not yet through gathering them to his house of prayer for all the nations. Shall we then be one with him and his right shepherd in his work? Yes, by working together with him, by keeping on preaching the good news of the triumphant kingdom and carrying on all the educational work by which the sheep ones can, gather, can be gathered and this work be accomplished in its completion. Let us aid the sheep like foreigners to see the vital need and opportunity now to join themselves to Jehovah, to minister unto him, and to love the name of Jehovah, to be his servants, to keep his antitypical Sabbath by not profaning it with egotistical works of self-righteousness, trying to save themselves their own way, but to hold fast Jehovah's new covenant by accepting its temple, its priesthood, its meteorship, its sacrifices for forgiveness of sins and its education in the knowledge of Jehovah, from the least of them even to the greatest of them. If we do this, then we shall be found not turning aside the sojourner or foreigner from his right, but loving him as ourselves. Hence at Armageddon, Jehovah in his holy temple will not be a swift witness against us with the execution of fiery judgments but will approve us and will spare us and carry us on into joyful worship through Armageddon, right on into his righteous new world. And that's where all of us want to be. <laughs> to make all the sheep-like foreigners still more joyful in his house of prayer, Jehovah has provided another aid to worship him. This new book entitled you may survive Armageddon into God's new world. <laughs> this book of 384 pages corroborates this glorious title in a manner that no other book has ever done before, particularly with reference to all the sheep-like foreigners. It sets out a picturization of these Armageddon survivors and their present obligations and their noble activities to a scale and with a variety that no other one volume ever has. The very title of the book is not only an assurance of a grand opportunity but also an invitation to the beholder to take advantage of this opportunity to survive Jehovah's coming expression of judgment from his temple and to enter the portals of his new world Showing a person how to do something is really an invitation for him to do it. May all of you procure a copy of this book and not only broaden your own understanding on how to make possible your own survival by Jehovah's undeserved kindness through Christ, but also extend the invitation to others to experience this survival by putting this book in their hands and then helping them to study it with their copies of their own Bible. This book, You May Survive Armageddon into God's New World, you can get this afternoon from the ushers after this meeting is dismissed on a contribution of 50 cents. All of the pioneers and brothers from other countries who are missionaries or branch servants 
can also get a copy of this book free by going to the book room. I'm sure that every one of the 35,753 here this afternoon are going to enjoy this immensely. And I'm sure that all of you will continue to worship Jehovah God in his holy temple.